Well, thanks everybody for being here. He said he's here. <laughs> Maybe he's there as an attendee or something. Patrick said he's here, Mike. Possible. Um, Could DJ, I'll, I'll find him okay. and bring him okay. up. Yeah. Okay, fine. So sorry about that. Okay, so um, it's really nice to have for the trade and publishing section, we've got four really good speakers. We've got Robin Walker, who's an author and publisher, his, historian, but everybody's going to talk about themselves after I've just introduced them by name anyway. And, and Hannah Chukwu from uh, Hamish Hamilton, uh, Penguin Random House Books. We have Natalie Jerome from the Literary Agency at Avitas Creative. Did I pronounce that right? That's right, yeah, yeah, Creative. well done. Yep. Okay, and Patrick Vernon, he's going to join us very soon, who's also an author and a publisher. Because Robin, did he publish your first book? True. Oh, Patrick. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm going to ask everybody to do is just talk a little bit about themselves and what they do. And then we're going to watch this film clip of a new, uh, there's a new website that's been set up for writers called Writers Mosaic. So we've got three and a half minutes to watch that. And then we're basically going to kick our questions off after that video, starting off from that video about, you know, what can be done for black writers. Um, can I, can I just say, can I just say, sorry, Khadija, um, that the Writers Mosaic video um, is in partnership with Literature Wales. And really? I've been, yes, yes. Um, and I've been asked to mention that because I sit on the board of Literature Wales. Oh, great. Um, which is brilliant. Okay. So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, saw, I saw it had him from RFL was yes. well, Literary Fund. Oh, that's really good. So it, yes, so that's really good. it is really uh, national and not English focused. It is national. Yes. Yeah, that's good because that need that needs to happen. Thanks for that. Great. So, um, so can I ask Robin if you can say a little bit about yourself and what do you do, etc., and how we'll talk about how you come, how you came to publish your book as well a bit later, as part of the questions. Okay. Well, my name is Robin Walker. I'm also known as the Black History Man. Uh, what I do for a living is I teach Black studies up and down the country. I'm also the education officer of a charity in South London called Croydon Supplementary Education Project. Uh, I'm also an investor and uh, a publisher. Over the last, um, since what, 20, 2006, um, I've published a number of books on uh, black studies, some of them to do with history, some of them to do with science, some of them to do with religion some of them to do with music, some of them to do with literature, some of them to do with business. So that's me. Great, thank you. And then later on, you can tell us how we can get your books and all there and send us a link for that. So also, can Hannah, can you talk a little bit about yourself and what you do, where you are? Yeah, of course. So I'm assistant editor at Hamish Hamilton, um, which is an imprint that's part of Penguin Random House. Um, and we publish literary fiction and nonfiction. Um, the kind of most relevant to this talk uh, thing that I'm working on is the Black Britain Writing Back project with Bernadine Evaristo, which I am the editor for. Um, and also I work on uh, Penguin's Lit in Colour campaign, which is aiming to kind of diversify the English um, curriculum across the country. So this is a subject that's very close to my heart um, and I kind of get to work on that in an editorial capacity. That's great. I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in that. You said diversifying across the country, the curriculum. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Natalie from Wales. Hi. Yes, hello. Yes, um, so I am a, a literary agent, former publisher, commissioning editor, um, working, specializing um, in commercial nonfiction. Um, the bookseller described me as a brand publishing wizard. Um, which basically means that I work um, with people across the entertainment world and I bring them to the world of books um, and help them become authors. Um, and I also take people who aren't necessarily um, well known, obviously, in the, the entertainment book world, um, become brands um, through their writing. So, I mean, I've worked with all sorts of people over the years, um, Alan Carr and Chris Evans and JLS and... Um, lots of people. Um, I spent five years just publishing One Direction. 
Um, as a literary agent now, uh, my clients include David Harewood and Seleni Henry, who is writing for children, which is brilliant. Okay. Um, have we got um, Patrick yet? If not, do we have Patrick? I'm here. Okay, great. Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Hi, hi, hi everyone. Hello. Hi there. Hi. So, Patrick Vernon, uh, activist writer, publisher, make hot, make teas and lattes occasionally, all kind of stuff. So, I mean, I've been, I, I mean, in many ways, I, I, I've um, established Every Generation nearly 18 years ago. And most of my work has been through the web, uh, through the website Every Generation, and then the website 100 Great Black Britons then became a book last year. And I've worked with Robin, I published his book When We Ruled. Um, but I've worked with other writers and published their books. I've, I've published about four or five hardback books on non-fiction books to do with uh, music, uh, history, um, cultural history, Caribbean history, history of Caribbean photography uh, as well. And also I've, I've developed my own, uh, I launched a board game a couple of years ago called the Windrush Game as well. And, uh, and I've written lots of articles, mainly online in newspapers, like Voice and Guardian, and lots of special stuff to do with mental health. And I've been, I've contributed to a couple of anthologies, one coming out next month, I think June called I Can't Breathe, um, which is uh, about a hundred different voices about the, the people's experience of racism in Britain. And it does exist in Britain today, prior to contrary opinion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, before we, um go and watch uh, Writer's Mosaic. I should actually introduce myself. I'm sorry to do that. I forgot about that. My name's Khadija Sasei, or, um, or, or Khadija George, people also know me as, and I'm currently doing my PhD in um, Pan-Africanism and Black British Publishing. And I've worked mainly with independent small press, but I kind of work freelance across the board working with black and Asian writers, mainly with anthologies and stuff like that, but also in writer development. Um, that's what I do just very briefly. But what we're going to do is now we're going to watch this new, it's about three and a half minutes of a new website for writers called Writers Mosaic. So please, Michael, can we see that? Writers Mosaic is like when you step out of the city and look up into the night sky and see that many more stars. They've always been there, but you never saw them before. For me, being welcomed by Writer's Mosaic has been exhilarating and liberating. It is a platform where you immediately feel welcome, valued and heard. To misquote Groucho Marx, I would only become a member of a club that would have someone like me as a member. And that club is Writer's Mosaic. A celebration of modern, magical British writing. For me personally, Writer's Mosaic is a validation that I and others like me belong, that we have always belonged on the British writing scene. Now, we came up with Writer's Mosaic before the tragic events of George Floyd, before things like diversity became buzzwords, and we're really passionate about showing a whole bunch of different writers from different backgrounds and showcasing their work and them themselves as writers. It's a place where we can showcase our work. We can also critique our work and have interviews with other writers, writer to writer. And it's a great place to be able to find out what we're up to and also to, to find out about work that you may not have seen or heard of before. Difference matters. And as a space to engage with other writers and to explore and experiment with writing, Writer's Mosaic brings into being those other colors in the spectrum of light that we don't usually see, but are always present. I feel compelled to bring this discovery of a cross-cultural poetics that allow characters to have root and branch and wing 
in seemingly wildly different but connected landscapes. I loved all words. Words could tell stories and stories could be time machines. Stories could be rocket ships able to transport people to other worlds. Stories were like an invitation to luxuriate the way nature does, to keep as still as a butterfly on a leaf before it lifts off. Eyes are on you, taking it in, taking you in as a person, as a concept, as an artist. Ugh, artist. That word is disgusting. But I hope that no one finds out you're a fraud. It's going to happen one day, then what? On restless nights, disturbed mornings, a synaptic jump summons me to pen. In sublime silence, ink slides between paper fibres, constellations of human on a page. A soul on a mission to state a world needing reminding that it is love. Thank you. Thank you. So people take note that that uh, site is now live as of yesterday. Um, but what I wanted to just throw out there and I'll go to um, between like Hannah and Natalie first, that kind of, this kind of site, uh, how does this kind of site help writers to get published? And, and where do they, can people look for these kind of resources? Because we know it's not the only one, it's the latest one and it's a, a really good one, but where do they find the resources and how will it help? How do these things help? So Hannah? Yeah, yeah, thinking about this question, I think, um, one of the huge uh, advantages to platforms like that is about finding a shared community and a shared network. Um, Cause a lot of those, uh, the people in the video are kind of talking about um, this being an opportunity to, to feel seen and to feel heard. And I think that kind of finding that community and finding your champions as well, like the people that are gonna support you um, from your earliest kind of stages are so important for a long-term career. And especially when you're first kind of needing to get feedback and, and honing your voice, being able to do that in a safe space where you feel comfortable and feel kind of, um, yeah, supported and uplifted by the people around you is, is so important. Um, and in terms of kind of looking to other resources, um, so Hamish Hamilton published a literary magazine called Five Giles Magazine, which is only um, uplifting underrepresented writers. Um, and so kind of one of the huge things that, that we hope that that's able to do is um, really kind of help very early career writers. So, so people who maybe haven't been able to plug into the literary network yet or kind of been able to, to find their, their people, it's kind of giving you that first step, um, I think is what these kind of platforms are so, so helpful for, is just um, having that support around you as you start. Mm -hmm. Natalie, could you add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'd echo um, what Hannah is saying. We've just at Literature Wales um, launched a program for writers from um, uh, underrepresented backgrounds, and it's a it's a sponsorship program. So it actually, you know, supports you financially um, with your writing. And we just went through the most incredible process, um, you know, of judging all the submissions. The submissions were phenomenal. And, you know, I, I joked at the time that the judging um, session is probably the longest Zoom call I've had of my entire life. It was like eight hours long, but the incredible thing, yeah, it went on for quite a while, but genuinely because, you know, the, the talent was, was amazing. There were so many poets um, here, so many black poets um, in Wales, across Wales that again, you know, for me kind of made sense given, you know, this is the land of song. Um, and it's so interesting that, you know, people from the diaspora have moved, obviously, to um, places like Wales and have absorbed the culture and refashioned it and reworked it. And then, you know, we're creating art, you know, from it. And I think, you know, um, programmes like the Writers Mosaic and development, um, you know, initiatives that Hannah's talking about are so helpful because it does create that sense of community that you're not on your own. Um, and a large part, I think, you know, especially being of um, black um, and, you know, mixed heritage is that you do feel quite isolated within the publishing industry. You know, um, it can feel very remote. Um, I certainly felt that, you know, coming from Wales, 
moving to London, I had to leave my home, <laughs> literally, at, you know, 18, first to go to college and then to work. And it's, you know, ironic for me now, having come home after 20 years of living in London and working in London, you know, across the corporate publishers, that I've had the most incredible, like, creative year of my professional year here, <laughs> back at home so you know I'm plugged back into my community my school friends are here everyone's here and I think you know that's the brilliant thing about these writers um you know either development programs or initiatives these communities that you know can really foster that creativity so you, you're not isolated so I think that that's a really important part right yeah because I think there was a survey done quite a while ago when I was um living and working in Yorkshire and it kind of said that emerging writers before money for them, it is time and being in a community of writers. Those two things are actually more important than the money, mm -hmm. which is interesting, yeah. Yes, because yeah. I think sometimes people um, underestimate that creativity is it's work. Mm -hmm. It is actual work. <laughs> I think um, a lot of the time people think it's fun, <laughs> just fun, and obviously it is, but it is also a discipline. Mm -hmm. And that discipline can feel isolating if, you know, you're not in amongst you know other writers who are trying to do the same thing which is to get published yeah. <laughs> ultimately yeah yeah well, Patrick <laughs> when you were just talking about your, yourself and what you do you've been involved in so many fields so could you say something about how else people can work in publishing if they don't want to work in with like the mainstream large publishers like like Hannah is doing there are other ways and there are other areas could you say something about that please yeah well i think with the advent of um social media on web so everyone's got a blog i'm sure all of us have got a blog and some people have converted their blogs into books and there have been quite some successful examples of of people who've done that you know um so uh i mean when i launched my website every generation which was back in 2002 I can remember there was only about four black websites in existence in Britain at the time. There was Black Britain Online, run by Kofi, who now runs Colourful Radio. There was, um, uh, there was, um, oh, there was Black Chronicle, there was Black Presence, there was um, Black Net. Uh, um, there were loads of African-American websites. And, it's, and if you look at that timeline from 2002 to where we are now, and, uh, and, in terms of everyone wants to get into the mainstream publishing world and try and get published as author. But over the last 20 years, a lot of people, I'm sure Robin could talk about his experiences, a lot of people have either had to, had to force to go down the self-publishing route and then eventually once they've self-published, they might get picked up by a mainstream publisher, basically, or people just furrow in their lanes doing their own stuff. And I mean, for me, I mean, I do lots of stuff. I wasn't planned to be involved in publishing. Actually, it's by default I've got a publisher because, uh, you know, Robin approached me about his book and I published his book and then I got involved in other people's books. Uh, and, and I mean, and all the stuff I, I was writing about, because uh, when people talk about creative writers, talk about creative writing, it's all about fiction. But it, non-fiction always gets missed out. Or, or I, might, I think it feels like there's a pecking order that fiction writing's at the top not non-fictions in the middle at the bottom and didn't get the same kudos or recognition. No, I mean, there are certain exceptions of that, like obviously like David Olusugu and a couple of other people. But apart from that, it's always about the, the fiction writing, which is important. And it is important, maybe, but non-fiction writing is important. It's around politics, around critical analysis, around, you know, all the issues which has an impact on us as black people in Britain today uh, and, and globally. You know, in many ways, some of the most powerful books have been non-fiction books, basically. You know, so, but it never gets set, that same kudos and recognition compared to the fiction world. So I think a lot of people, either, it's, I mean, a no, fair amount of people might be in the academic world and they will translate, get, transcend into writing the academic press, but even with the academic press, the way it's marketed, it's a very small marketplace unlike America where it's, it's a different world. So I think what I've been doing as a community activist is doing stuff online uh, and then trying to collaborate with a whole range of people. And it's just purely by luck and coincidence that I got approached by Robinson Books, me and my colleague, uh, Angelina, Dr. Angela Osborne, to do 100 Great Black Britons, to be quite honest. Uh, you know, and so it's, it's, I mean, you know, it's 
it's not for the faint-hearted, we, we all know that. Uh, and I think part of the challenge is now people can create their own platforms, very similar to the whole music industry in the film world, you can create your own platform. But if you want to be in the Son of Times bestseller, it's, you have to, it's very rare that your self, a self-published book gets into the Son of Times bestseller list or the bookseller top 10. So, but then we need to create more platforms uh, uh, around, if not around black publishers, at least around black writers to get that kudos. And it's interesting, Natalie, you have this title, you're, you're a brand, well, you're a brand guru. So you, you convert, the, someone's got a brand already and you convert yes. them and you, can, they, you put their brand in publishing. Yes, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. And you're right um, in terms of, you know, sometimes there is an undervaluing. I've certainly felt that at times in my career of commercial nonfiction and what it can do. Um, you know, it can reach, we can reach more people sometimes, you know, um, in this area. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, conversations, started conversations with someone like David Harewood, who um, you might have heard of, he did a documentary um, about his psychotic breakdown. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of chimed with me because, you know, personal background, my dad worked in psychiatric care and was a psychiatric um, yeah. nurse professional for pretty much yeah. his entire, you know, adult working life. And so I knew what the stats were growing up. We talked about the fact that, you know, the hospital yeah. wards are full of black men. And so, you know, it was lingua franca for me, but what we didn't have, I felt was someone who could really move the needle, talk about this, you know, with the platform and with the reach across demographics, but also across racial lines, because I feel sometimes the conversation can feel narrow where, you know, books are or have been published by black authors for black read, specifically for black readerships or with the, the intention of. And actually what we're trying to do is just publish stories for everybody <laughs> and mm -hmm. let everyone come to the party because we learn that way you know, you know, fundamentally we're human beings. So, yeah. you know, we have more in common than we don't. And so that's the, I think the power of what we can do with commercial nonfiction. So, you know, the inspiration for David was, um, funny enough, uh, was the Ralph Ellison um, Invisible Man book, which I read, God, yeah. decades ago. Um, and it struck me that, you know, no one had really talked about their mental health, black mental health, and the you know intersection of race and mental health powerfully for si over sixty years, yeah, <laughs> which is not, which is each other because that's really yes. Um, Patrick's area is around yes. issues of mental yeah. health. Yeah, yes. I mentioned mention that because you know, to, with all due respect, there are lots of people I know who write about mental health all the time. But they don't get that kind of platform. Exactly. That's to, exactly it. That's, there's lots of people. There's up, you know, um, people people with lived experiences of mental health have been in and out of the psychiatric system for for decades, and they write their poetry, they do their stuff, and some of them quite, some of them even self-publish. You've got a whole range of. I mean, this year, four books have come out written by black therapists: Dwight mm. Dwight Turner, Eugene Ellis. Um, yes but what you yes. need is is the commercial so so someone who has the reach commercially to basically to help push the door open so that others can come through and I think that you're right about you know the distinction between commercial nonfiction and academia um, and the academic approach and sometimes you can move a needle you know, my experience overnight with someone who already brings an audience with them. So, and that's the skill, I guess. Right. I mean, this should be, you know, we'll use it as a topic on its own because it is a very, very important one. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm going to go over to Robin because number one, he's got some of the experiences that Patrick spoke about, about forging his own way. But also I want to speak to you specifically around, around, um, Black history books. So, Robin, can you first of all maybe just touch on how you forged your way um, with, with 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 Patrick there helping you as well? Yeah, um, my first serious book was When We Ruled that Patrick published, and it has to be said, if I may say so, sir, the book was excellent. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of money you went into it. it. A, a lot of money went into the designing. A lot of mm -hmm. money went into the printing. The you know. And it came out as a hardback book. I think it, the first edition was 722 pages. And 
you know, we, we knocked it out of the park. Now, since then, um, I've been introduced to Amazon Kindle, KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. And what I've done ever since has been to publish my own books, and I do them through Amazon KDP. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, that is the future for uh, uh, authors who want to become entrepreneurial, who want to build their own income streams, and who want to become financially free. So, um, I mean, the, I mean, the whole thing around Amazon and publishing with Amazon as well is kind of quite controversial for some people, because yes, it does make you entrepreneurial free, but it's in terms of, um, there are a lot of other issues there as well, which we won't go into at the moment, because what I really would like you to speak about since the, the, the seminar today is around history, is to just say something about um, people buying black history books um, and do people think of black history in a narrow way? We were talking earlier about the, the span of history. Do you think the black people, particularly, do you think they talk, think about black history in a narrow kind of way and so are not focused on particular kind of books? It's only if somebody like Patrick can do something like 100 Black Britons and people really get excited about it. But like we know, there's lots of other books there that are really important that don't get the same level of excitement. In terms of the work that you've been doing, how have you seen people, uh, you know, like react to getting history books? It, one of the things is, you see, the 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 um, people I work with and the people I move with tend to be quite serious about Black history anyway, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of wide excitement from books on Black Britain to books on ancient Africa two books on medieval African civilizations, two books on mass enslavement, two books on anti-slavery resistance, two books on Pan-Africanism, two books on the Caribbean, two books on black presence in Far East Asia. You, the, the, the circles I move in, those are the kinds of circles you see, yeah? Um, one of the things is, is um, that's a different circle to people that do black British history, if I can call it black British history, TM, trademark. What they're about is a different agenda to what we're about. And they are very, very different worlds. You know, for, um, one thing on doing an event like this is I get to see what the other side is doing. You know, it's a different world. So we were talking, I think there was a bit of a chat before in the previous session about the general reader. So we can't even generalize or say like the general black reader, but how do we get- and I Oh, know you can, you can, you can. What I'm saying is that people-, people are reading history books. No, so that's what I'm saying to you. The people that deal with black history, mm -hmm. I know those people because I move with those people. I work with those people. Do you see? Mm -hmm. But what you'll find is, is um, if you restrict it to black history, excuse me, black British history TM, you're not going to reach those people because that's not what they want to read about. Mm. Yes, just to pick up on that point, I think it's been interesting the last 12 months or so now, especially in the wake of Black Lives Matter, that, you know, there have been a raft of deals for black talent. Um, so many. I mean, how do you see, you know, one after the other? And I think, um, you know, what we're starting to see is, you know, maybe a slightly clearer picture of what our lives are like here. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, yeah, <laughs> because of that. And it's one of the things that, you know, I've been arguing about for so long, as in you just publish everything. <laughs> so, you know, even, you know, talking today, you know, history. Well, it's, it's, it's history, yes, but it's, it's our lives. And you know all of our lives, and that could be that could be science fiction, that could be you know memoir. It could be lots of different things, as long as you know we're representing ourselves and our creativity in in all sorts of different ways. Um, obviously, because you know I specialise in nonfiction and commercial nonfiction particularly. I'm just really pleased that some of the big you know um, powerful uh, names across the entertainment world are coming to the book world. Because what I want to see are books that, A, they can bring their audiences with them. <laughs> they can reach out to everyone in a way that, you know, sometimes as a debut author, it's challenging. 
and I completely you know I accept that it's so challenging it's challenging for anyone and it's especially challenging if you're um, black but also that you know the the reaching out means that commercial success the commercial success that they potentially can bring to the book world and what they're doing can open doors for debut authors and we sometimes do see that you know it's almost kind of like a slipstream so you know um David you know with his book title maybe I don't belong here Michaela Cole her book title Misfits you know, so when we're, you know, talking about what it means to be black and British, you know, in two book titles from, you know, established stars, you kind of get the picture, <laughs> you kind of get the gist of, you know, what it might be like, actually, you know, if you're a regular person um, living here. And I think that's actually quite important because, you know, the pervasive narrative has been so bizarre over the last 12 months, you know, with people, very noisy voices like Piers Morgan and Lawrence Fox and so on, that you, you, we need that counter narrative in a robust way, I think. Um, so I think, you know, that, that for me is, it, it's been a heartening thing that has come out of, you know, what have been quite dramatic seismic, you know, moments over the last 12 months and painful moments over the last 12 months. I think what has been quite frustrating for a lot of writers, and maybe something, this is something that you could all kind of uh, maybe speak to, is before those 12 months, well, even I'd say even before, you know, like mm. the last past five years, what was frustrating is that when you did have somebody like a David Harewood, um, but let me go even back further, like a Ben Oakry, what we would then get from, from the main publishers was, well, we've already got one. Yes. So we need another mm -hmm. one of you. <laughs> you know is this changing yeah. or if not, how do we force yeah. the change because that needs to change so Hannah is not a yes Hannah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I feel like um the series really speaks to this because um so in the series we've published books um that were originally published across the last century um and didn't kind of receive the attention that they deserved at the time um which I think says a lot about how far we've come and, and how much like has changed in that time but also you know it's a lot of them are very specific to like a time in the 90s when there, there was like a, a little bit of an open door that then like maybe closed for some of those writers like it's a really it's been like an evolving conversation but kind of speaking to them about what their experience was like you know, as little as 30 years ago in comparison to now is is very, very kind of shocking. And that they all had that feeling of like, why why am I not being heard? And 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 you know, I, I do feel like I have this talent and I feel like what I've I've written like kind of deserves a platform and, and they didn't have that at all in any capacity. And so like the series is a kind of backlist series because we're publishing republishing books that have been published in the past. But actually the way that we've been talking about it and the way that kind of readers are responding to it is as like a front list publication because it's almost like it's 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 news that this is now like some, something that what are the titles uh, just drop the titles on us yeah that just come out yeah so there's the dancing face without prejudice bernard and the cloth monkey the fat lady sings minty alley um and without prejudice are the six titles uh, and okay. so they're all fiction titles yeah and the fourth was <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> people wouldn't have known about those. About yes, them. exactly. Yeah. Uh, it, it's good. To, it's good to hear that. Uh, but I think there's a kind of a, there is a time lag missing. Okay, let her mm. just finish first of all, please. Oh, sure. Patrick, okay. And then I'll come back to you. So just tell us yeah. who the authors were. Of you course, have the ones in there. Go ahead. Yeah. So we've got Judith Bryan. We've got Jacqueline Roy. We've got Nicola Williams, Mike Phillips, S. I. Martin, and C. L. R. James. Mm. Other authors. Great. Great. Okay, and we're going to drag out for you the next ones that are coming. The cover designs are lovely, Hannah. Can I just say the cover designs are lovely? Thank you so much, Natalie. <laughs> Can I just ask you, was it, was, it, was, yep. it a black, was it a black designer for the covers? Yeah, six different okay. black designers. That's all right, all, all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be knocking on your door asking you why. No, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, Patrick, Patrick, you were going to say. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's great that you've done this book. I think also is it Beryl Gilroy's book's been really done as well. Yes, it's um, coming out in July. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll send a copy of that. It's really great. I think that what's happened is if you look at the period of the late 1970s up to the mid 1990s, which probably that was probably the time when mainstream publishers weren't really interested in black, black fiction and non-fiction uh, based, apart from the exception of one or two people. There's a whole 
um, gap of literature that needs to cover that period from a creative, from a from a fiction and non-fiction perspective. So a classic example is with the Steve McQueen's films, it, you know, and people said the first they didn't know about the kind of mangrove knife. They didn't know, you know, the whole stuff around blues parties and love. You know, the whole, there's a whole genre of stuff that needs we need to now. You know, people maybe of my age and younger have to run who had those stories and they got rejected 20 years ago. Can you go now, can say to them, get out your old manuscripts about your experiences living in Britain in the 70s, 80s, 90s, because now it's now currency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a question, that's all, you know. Yeah, I'm actually going to be doing a book with Benjamin Zephaniah and we're kind of tracing that through poetry, black people's yeah. lives through poetry, uh, yeah. yes. I mean, and the other thing also, I grew up in the Midlands, uh, and it's always still very London centric, I have to say. The publishing world is all about London. If you've not lived in Tottenham, oh, yes. or Brixton, yeah. I'm from it. Manchester, so I forget feel like it. Oh, oh my God. Me, I was a Londoner and I moved to Leeds, and people thought yeah. there was something wrong with me. They thought I was ill. Yeah. Why, why could you go into Leeds? What's happened to her? And it's like, mm. it's a very vibrant place um, up, up north with publishing, especially with small publishers. That's the best place for them. They're great, you know. So, yeah, yeah so it's, I suppose we're talking about not only that there's only that one writer, but there's that only that one publisher. Um, can you add to that, please, Robin? Not really, no. Um, I don't know what the publishing scene north of the Watford Gap service station is, so I, I can't really add to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But did you get, even with the work that you've been doing, get the sense that, you know, um, that they are, people think that there's only one, there's only one writer in a particular area, so there wasn't a gap for anybody else, because you like seem to you like. See, because, no, because I, 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 you see, in the circles that I move in, that's not really a discussion. Do you see? Mm. Um, in other words, um, among the people I move in, it's uh, if, if 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 I come up with something out, you know, new that's out, people will be talking about it. If Candace comes up with something, people will be talking about it. If Patrick comes up with something, people will be talking about it. And our thing is, if something is new and it's hot, um, I remember the buzz when uh, Onyeka put out his book on Blackamoors, uh, the buzz up and down the country in black communities, do you see? So it, there isn't the sense of there's just one person, but but that's the circles I move in. I can't speak for mainstream publishing because obviously I'm not in that circle. Can, can, can I ask you a question, Robin? Because I think the, yeah, the circles that you move in are important. Yeah. And I know that you put all your energy is publishing, but if Natalie said to you, Robin, come over to the dark side. Okay, not exactly. No, I don't mean that way. Horribly. No, 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 that's good. That's a good question. Carry on. Hilarious. <laughs> no, but no, no, no. Because Robin, because I mean, Robin is a brand already. Uh, yeah. He's well known and well respected in the community. Okay, the average Daily Mail meet and reader would not know about Robin or the Guardian reader even, but he's well known. So is there some? Is there also a job about promoting people who've got a track record, a proven track record, to uh, so they can have a different audience and that new audiences can see that there's a whole range because there's a whole range of stuff. I'll give you a good example. So a couple of years ago, um, the BBC made a radio program saying where are the black historians. And um, yes, and and the, uh, at that time, there's only one black professor of history, Hakim Adi, who's also a writer uh, himself as well, an uh, author, and 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 I did I wrote an article on one of the best websites, which really promotes a lot of writers with media diversify. A lot of people have used that as a real fantastic platform, and we need, uh, and I think we we'll probably even need it today. Even it's even more critical to give, especially in the context of the Soul Report, where we can actually do critiques uh, and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, I wrote an article um, on Media Diversify, I think it still might be there, and I name-checked Robin, I name-checked over 100 people I know, black people in Britain, who write, who who write non-fiction stuff around black history, or the, the, the diversity of black history, to make the point that we exist, we, we, we are here, you know, you know, you know, and it's great that we've got David and one or two other people, but actually there's a whole plethora of people out Absolutely. there who got the platform. So the question is, should the role of mainstream publishers now actually um, be almost like record producers? Yes. Actually go out there. Yes. The <laughs> That's <names>. what I do. <laughs> I okay. 
you that's exactly you. what I do and that's how you know I've stuck around the industry for so long yeah. um is exactly that we are on the editorial Hannah um you know we'll um agree with this you know we are a and r people that's the whole point where yeah there to find the next and the next and the next. My point um, with regards black talent though, is because, you know, we've been so underpublished. I mean, it was only what, um, uh, five years ago, 2016, that the Guardian reported of the top 500 books, six were um, written by black British authors, six. Mm. So, you know, <laughs> we've got so much work to do. So the reason that, you know, commercially, I'm going after, or, you know, trying to persuade people like Sir Henry Henry and or not even persuade, he wanted to write for children, but, um, you know, David Harewood and to bring them into, you know, um, the book world is so that we have the numbers. So, you know, the people who keep saying to me, oh, but, you know, um, books by black authors, they don't sell or whatever. It's like, well, Sadie Smith sold half a million copies. Mallory Blackman has sold a million copies. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it just, this doesn't make sense. And so these, these cases, you know, um, suddenly become isolated. Well, these authors become isolated incidents and they're not. So what we need to see is a lot of people being published who are black and selling lots of books. Mm -hmm. And then once we have that, then everyone. <laughs> Didn't you work with I can ask you, why do a lot of famous people, well, including famous black writers, like to write for children? Why is that? I'm glad you asked me because I've always wanted to write for children. It's like every famous person wants <laughs> to have a restaurant and have a book. Yeah, well, I mean, not 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 in my experience. No, I mean, not necessarily okay. in my experience, no. Um, I mean, I'm thinking more along the lines of, you know, Lorraine Pascal selling a million copies across three books of her cookery. Mm. And people have forgotten that, you know, I mean, I'm talking about it all, but in all respects, um, you know, there's been a recent renaissance with regards Octavia E. Butler and her science fiction, and she was so ahead of her time. Mm -hmm. But what we need are, are the commercial successes, I keep saying this, we need books to sell on a regular basis because then it normalizes the publishing landscape for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the question, what's the balance act between someone who can sell 200,000 copies to someone who can sell maybe 15, 20,000 copies, but the, 20, the book might be seminal and powerful in educating, informing and challenging? Because we're in the context now in Britain in 2021, where we've been gaslighted by the government. Yeah. And we need now, we need to have, you know, even more so to have critical perspectives on race, identity and belonging. Absolutely. And one of the, you know, big frustrations for me, you know, over the years as an acquiring editor, is there's a lot of books don't sell, <laughs> but they're still published mm. uh, by, by white authors. Yeah. And yeah. so I don't know how we've managed to get into, a, you know, a situation like this, um, as in not us. Um, specifically, but um, generally, you know, the hand wringing over publishing one black author yeah, I know. who may sell 15,000 copies. Great. <laughs> mm, 15,000, yeah. That's 15,000 copies. Great. I've seen a lot of books sell a lot less than that. <laughs> and, and yet, when the, has, and when the author's been white, they've got a lot more money. <laughs> so but, that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 Robin, would you like to comment? Um, again, I can't really speak for the mainstream. I can't. I mean, we'll speak from that's your not, own experience. Yeah, that's not my that's not my lane. In my lane, I know what works. In my lane, I know what people want to read. In my lane, I know you know what I'm saying. So, um, and for me, since this is a Black History thing, my thing is to get that um, as possible. Now, as far as the the people that work in mainstream, um. It doesn't have to be working with me, but the, the main point is, is that I can't think of a single mainstream book dealing with ancient Africa, not one. Yeah, why not? Um, you can't have a situation where the alt-rightists are on the march everywhere in the planet, where you've got um, a, a prime minister that believes it's acceptable to speak of certain segments of the British population who has watermelon smiles. And when you've got 
um, people who think like that. The only way you can challenge it is by showing African heritage. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of one mainstream book that attacks that head on. And if you guys have got the pull, then you guys should be commissioning that. Real talk. Hannah. I was Fair enough. Yeah. Yes, Hannah. Yeah. I want you to comment yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, again, with the series, kind of to your point earlier, um, Patrick, about the, the missing timeline, you're absolutely right. And that's the reason that this is kind of the, the start of the series. So next year, we're publishing six nonfiction books. And most of the ones we've commissioned so far are actually in the time period you're talking about, because this is an ongoing, ever evolving conversation. And there's so many things that have been hidden and have been have not been allowed to kind of um, shine in the way that they were meant to. So I think that's the, the main kind of takeaway I've had from this year and this whole experience is that it just doesn't, it shouldn't stop. Like it can't just be like, okay, this this event has happened and we're now having these conversations. Let's like commission to this area or let's like think about this one topic and then we move on. But because we have to keep, always keep coming back to these conversations because there's always more that like hasn't, um, yeah, being able to kind of come to the surface the way that it, it should do. So, I mean, I completely agree with you that it's just a, a continuing conversation and we always need to be listening, especially to the people who've been talking about this for so long. Like that's that's what's so important is that this, you know, we're all kind of standing on the shoulders of people who've been doing this work for a long time and um, we have to make sure that we're always listening to them. Robin, can I ask you about, because I know you, you um, you channel your work through Amazon. Is there That's another right. platform apart from Amazon? If people still wanted to do that same kind of doing it themselves, is there another platform apart from Amazon that people can go to, even if it might not be so big, but you know might have some potential behind it if they're feeling like, because as well, I think we're in a space where a lot of people now really want to, even if it's smaller, want to work with black. What is there? Uh, in truth, um... Black people who are, who are entrepreneurs with should create um, uh, basically duplicate that model in truth. That's what should happen. But between now and then, Amazon's got the biggest reach. Uh, I, there were companies around like Lulu.com, I think, are still around. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of academics uh, use Lulu and rate Lulu. Um, I, I think that's the, I think that is the rival. I think that is the rival. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention another couple of books that are coming out because of, as well, when sometimes when we think of history, we're thinking that it's way back. But you know, at the end of the day, it's this century as well. So um, I know that, and people, some of you guys will probably know this anyway. Black History Walks. In some ways, it's a bit like what Patrick does. You're creating another something else and then you have a book coming out of it. And I'm just so excited that Black History Walks are now gonna have a book out in the summer because the work they've been doing is great. And now it's gonna be in book form, True especially for people who's not here. Yeah. That's just amazing, it's brilliant. Um, yeah. And another book is going to be um, a fiction title and, um, and it's on the topic of slavery. And this is by Annie Domingo, and she's one. I've been already won a couple of awards for what she's been doing. And the story is based around um, um, Sarah Bonetta. Um, who became Sarah, ben uh, Sarah Forbes Bonetta, who became um, Queen Victoria's, um, which she lived with Queen Victoria, was she her goddaughter or something like something that? Like yeah. that yes. yeah. So that's yeah. going to be out in September, published by Jacaranda. Got to get in the name because Jacaranda, black publisher, you know, kind of big them up as well. So that book is going to be coming out in September. Um, and and um, as well, Patrick mentioned the one for with um, black teacher, Mrs. Gilroy, and that's Paul Gilroy's mum, the first black yeah. teacher. Black head teacher in the country. That yeah. is history. And that yeah. is so important. You know? It's very, very important. So I'm so pleased that they're they're doing that. And I don't, yeah. I don't believe it's gonna have like original like family photos in it as well. Yeah. Just to let you know, um Hundred Red Black Britons is gonna come out in paperback in September. Okay. And it's gonna come out in America in June. Okay, but when you went when you've got a beautiful book like that, and then sometimes you just don't want the paperback. I'm sorry, you've got to have the hardback. Well, you know, I, I think Robin's book when we ruled, and I, I know, and I worked him on the hardback. And I know he, he's done other versions, mm -hmm. but actually, if you go on, a, is it, I don't know what you, Robin could tell me. How is it? If you go on AB Books, how is it worth now? A hardback. There, there, there are some people selling the hardback for three thousand. I know that for a fact. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Seriously. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, gosh, that's almost as much as my Nelson Mandela book. 
Yeah, you know I mean, <laughs> but, 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 I mean, never bound edition of that. You know, some people that are proper taking the mick with it, but it's cool. It's yeah. cool. I'm not. I'm not arguing it. Yeah, but you know, that's what you know. And books are really valuable. That's why to me, I know that books will never go out of print. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, because you can't have an ebook and charge three thousand for it, can you? No, so, do you know what I mean? <laughs> If you've got a book and it's costing that and people want it, they will buy it, you know, yeah. because mm -hmm. it's it's valuable, it smells good. So yeah. Um, so I just gonna I'm gonna ask another question at the moment, then we're gonna see if we've got any other questions out there. Oh no, I'm also gonna ask people about their I know people have been putting in the chat their favorite black book, but their history book, as if to say there's only one, but then I'm gonna let you mention another one as well. Okay. <laughs> One of the things I wanted to ask, because I work with a lot of anthologies, I think anthologies are very important in terms of uh, thinking about the social and cultural history of the time. I just think they are so important, but that's, I think. What is the difference and, and how do people, especially when people maybe haven't even got um, a full length manuscript yet, but they still want to you know, get their word out there, get there and to get published, how do they do that? You know, sometimes you see, it's like, I've just heard that Patrick has got something coming out and I can't breathe. And I thought to myself, how come I didn't know about that? I want to be in that. How do people get into important books like this that are basically going to be telling people, even in five, ten years' time, about the history of what we're going through right now? How do we get, how do we get there? Well, who should I ask? Okay, let me ask Hannah, because I know, Hannah, sometimes you work with anthologists, like you're working on mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we're together. I'll, go to Hannah, I'll go to Patrick afterwards. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, well, I guess um, a good example, kind of, I mentioned at the beginning, um, Five Dials magazine and the Writers Mosaic, which you were talking about. So, platforms that are um, already kind of plugged into those networks, I think, are a really great place for, for writers to start um, to hear what's coming up and kind of make sure that they're, they're being told about what's happening and they're kind of on those radars. Um, we also know um, one of the publishers in Penguin Children who was working on the Black Joy book, a lot of their kind of outreach around that was through social media. So I think that is also can be a really brilliant way to kind of see where like editors and agents are putting very specific call outs out um, for writers to submit their work. And in those cases, a lot of the writers um, weren't agented or kind of weren't already part of the writing scene so that's a really great kind of direct way as well to I think to get your your work to be seen um yeah but that would probably be my yeah advice in terms of like so would you say even if people aren't into social media they've got to be on social media if you're into writing these no things? no absolutely not like they definitely don't that that is just one space that definitely I do think has had a role in in you know, leveling the playing field a little bit for, for kind of being able to, to, to come into those spaces, come into those networks without kind of having an agent or, or knowing, uh, you know, a huge amount of the publishing industry, which can be very opaque. I do think that can be a helpful platform, but no, that's definitely not, you know, we have lots of writers who don't have any social media presence whatsoever and, you know, couldn't stand the thought of being on there, which I completely understand, <laughs> if I'm honest. Yeah, I'm but yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe another source then where people who are starting out or just want to know about where, where can mm. you go to? Where yeah, you go? well, yeah, I think it's it's places like um, Writers Mosaic, New Writing North, um, as well as five like magazines that they, literary magazines where they admire the writing. I think it's reaching out directly to the editors there mm. would be my advice from my perspective. Okay, so like those writers' organisations, because I think we're quite lucky here because they don't have it like the same in the States, writers' organisations in the region. Yeah. New Writing South, spread the word. There's yeah. Scribe, uh, Writing East Midlands, mm. Writing West Midlands, have a New Writing North, have I missed anything out? There is a lot literature of- Wales, Literature Wales, Literature Wales. Literature Wales, yeah. literature Wales. there is stuff going up on in Scotland as well. There is, as a, I think it's Scottish, I'm not sure if they're called, no, Scottish Black Brain Writers, but maybe I'll find the details and- um, yeah. Them in. But I think they've got a Facebook out as well anyway. But there's also the um the library, the poetry library in Scotland, and they would be able to mm. get people to there. But there is now they were mm. always they were there, you know, black Scottish writers, but it was about the voice was quite quiet, but they're getting louder now. So mm. people need to 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 join them there as well. So there are there are resources around, and even if like one particular group can't help you, they will point you to another one because that's the work they're doing and they love it. <laughs> you know, and they love it. so people 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 do, and people do share. You know, I don't mm. understand this concept of people thinking that all writers just work in the in the attic because they don't. They do share. So mm. yeah. 
But um, I know that we're kind of like going to be coming to the time of the Q&A. So um, I just want to give everybody uh, a chance so that we don't run out of time to like make a mention another black history book that people have to read. <laughs> and also just plug something else that you want to plug. So Hannah. Thank you. Um, okay, well, the, the Black History book that I mentioned in the chat is um, Red Dust Road, Jackie Kay, uh, which is her memoir. Um, it's so good, isn't it? It's so fun. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's fantastic. That was a it seminal is. book, I'd say, um, for me, especially reading it as a teenager. Um, and yeah, then in terms of the work that I'm doing, it would be the next... Um, books in the Black Britain Writing Back series coming out in February, um, as well as ones that have just come out. Um, highly, highly recommend. Uh, there's a huge kind of range within there. Um, so I think everyone will definitely find something that they Yeah, they because there's enjoy. amazing writers with Har Hamish Hamilton. But yeah. also there is this link, there is also kind of, there's um, a site called the Coloured Museum, which mm. basically will tell you kind of like the people, one of you were saying about the people who've been doing it for years, on that site, people like me, Okay, people have been doing it for years mm -hmm. just to see what they've been doing. And the publisher of Hamish Hamilton has been doing quietly for years. Mm. So on his books, he has Bernadine Everisto, he has Zadie Smith. Mm. You know, I remember going to 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 now to dinner with, with Zadie Smith before just before she got her book published. You have um uh We've got Marlon James. Marlon James, Marlon, that's yes. in my head, Marlon yeah. James. Do you know what you mean? You've got um uh, Tennessee Coates. Yeah. Yeah. All of these amazing writers are sitting there with Hamish Hamilton. So when they come over, you need to come and invite us after. <laughs> yes, I'm not in that museum, by the way. Are you? Well, <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> no, well, Don't know what happened there. Yeah, we just kind of have to extend it. Mm. An ongoing project, we'll get to extend that. <laughs> That's why I love doing projects where you can actually, for example, to put somebody else's name in it. So I'm working on a book at the moment about decolonizing, decolonizing your bookshelf. So we, even though we can only write essays about 50 writers, there's a section at the bottom that says, if you like this, try this. And we try to squash mm. as many other writers in, into that section. Do you know what I mean? So that yeah. we pick up the other writers because we know that it's not just those 50 writers, it's all these other writers as well. So that's gonna be quite exciting. So um, yeah, but I keep thinking to myself, I need to get more of my friends in here. Otherwise, I'm going to lose friends if I don't get them into this book. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm trying to get everybody in. Like, how do we get them into this space? So, Natalie, please tell us uh, another history book. Please. Another history. My um, choice was David Olasuga's Black and British. Um, and the reason I've chosen that is because I found... Um, his take on the fact that you know obviously we've been here for forever <laughs> really quite important um and again um you know coming back to commercial non-fiction the fact that he says it and is able to reach so many people when david says this um i think is really yeah you know and it had a, a tv documentary with it the, just the platform um and it's not immediate for him either at first. No, no, I completely, you know, I, I see that, I accept that. Exactly, which is, again, the whole point. We need volume, <laughs> you know, in order, um, you know, for us to be successful, for everyone to be successful in the publishing space. But, yeah, and, you know, obviously with me, having left London, moved back home, you know, continued my um, creative publishing life and career, and I've had so many people in London go, what are you doing? <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going home. Are there any black people there? And it's just, so this is really important <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, um, for us. So, yeah, so that, that's my pick. Um, if I had one other, just very quickly, because Marlon um, uh, was mentioned, I really, really, really loved, for similar reasons, actually, um, the Book of Night Women. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was such a powerful, I mean, I've read lots of, you know, say books over the years and studied them and so on, but I thought that was such a powerful um, take. And the fact that it was focused on a group of women, I thought was just extraordinary, an extraordinary piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, and slave women, obviously. 
Um, so yeah, so that's the other one. The book that I'm working on at the moment, um, shout out, is David's book, um, Maybe I Don't Belong Here. Um, that's coming out in September. As I say, super powerful, um, you know, descriptions of his psychotic breakdown, the intergenerational nature of it as well, which I think is going to surprise people. Um, and hopefully will be a bit of a game changer in terms of the com the wider conversation about mental health and race in this country. I will just mention as well, the London Book Fair, which is traditionally a trade book fair, but is opening up now more to writers and everything. That's gonna be online this year in June. Yes, yes. So I, I, would, I would really strongly suggest people get onto that and check it out. They have some wonderful, wonderful seminars a lot of time. And usually when I work with emerging writers, especially outside of London, I mean, trying to get down to the London Book Fair for it to start at nine o'clock in the morning could cost a couple of hundred quid, which was absolutely ridiculous. So um, with our Inscribe program, we used to pay for it because we said the writers need to know the business of publishing. Um, yes, to they do. To understand yeah. why they're not getting published maybe, or just, just to be in that sphere to know what a kind of crazy place it could be. This year it's online and I would say people, please take advantage of it, London Book Fair, um, and, and do that uh, in, in June. I just kind of thought I'd mention that. Um, Robin, please plug, plug another book and plug yourself. Okay, there's a book called um, How Black People Overcame 50 Years of Repression in Britain, 1945 to 1995 by Vince Hines. I don't know if people have seen this. Oh. This is my favorite black British history book. Um, and then, of course, there's the most recent book that me and my team put out. We did a book called 30 Black History Icons, which is designed for Key Stage 3 secondary school. And it meets Mr. Michael Goh's national curriculum criteria exactly. Um, and so that's 33 classroom lessons. 33 classroom lessons is nearly, excuse me, is more than half a year. If you've got one history class per week mm -hmm. it's more than half a year's worth of work so here's my favorite book vince hines thank you uh, and that's and the, the other book of course is 30 black history icons cool wonderful patrick okay so one of the books my favorite books was uh, unfortunately i lost my copy you know when back in the day when people say oh, can i borrow your book and i'll get it back to you oh, and you don't no. see it again Oh, no. I've lost so many books over the years. You didn't loan huh? it to me. You didn't oh, loan no, it to me. No, no, no. It wouldn't, okay. yeah, no you wouldn't. But I lost it some time ago. Uh, it was, uh, it's a classic black history book written by Edward Scobie called Black Britannia in 1976. Oh, nice. yes. That book needs to be republished again, by the way. Yes. I agree with you. I classic. totally agree with you. That's been the book I've been using throughout my thesis. I've like, I almost... You've got it then. I want it back. Uh, <laughs> I want it back. for the British Library. <laughs> No, you're right. It's a fantastic yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the classic. I mean, so if you're doing a reprint, I mean, Edward Scobie was spent most of his time in America, but he did spend some time in Britain. Yes. And he spent, you know, and like with most books of that nature, he had to spend a lot of time in the British Library, um, like you're like you do in the British and the British Museum. Because the library was in the British Museum back in the day. So, and that's a, it's a classic book, really. Is um, uh, you know. Um, and the book, another book I'd like to choose is, uh, is, uh, is, is my, one of my mentors. He passed away nearly 15 years ago. Uh, one of the first memoirs written about uh, uh, a serviceman work, serving the Second World War, uh, um, Jamaica Airman, written by Eddie Martin Noble, published, yeah, by, published by Centre Prize. Published, no, published by New Beacon Books in 1984. Mm -hmm. Oh, was it not New Beacon Books? Okay. Yeah, it was New Beacon Books, 1980. Yeah, so brilliant. Just actually edited the book, actually. So it's a classic book. Um, where is it? I've got it. Oh, you'd be looking for that. And I'll tell my, I'll tell people my book, How You Were Abandoned oh, yeah. Africa by Walter Rodney. And his other book, alongside with it, Groundings. I thought that... Once I had to read Groundings twice before it really hit me, but, and it's a small book. It can be read very quickly. Um, yeah, I think Verso have now, have now republished. There, are, there it is, Jamaica Ehrman. This yeah. is original hardback. And Eddie lived in Hackney. And, uh, and, this, and then Andrew Lieber, who used to go to Centre Prize and did the writing there, was in, um, actually wrote 
her book Small Island, and she reviews some of the information from this book to write Small Island. Right. Anyway, so it's classic. Again, local, local, and look how yeah. important it was. You know, missing out on all of this, missing out on all of this. That's absolutely wonderful. So thank you for all of you for that. Um, do have one question at the moment in the, and I'm sure other people, if you do have questions, please put them in the, in the Q and A thing. Um, and this one is directly to Natalie. How can you be contacted regarding creative writing and obtaining a literary agent? How can I be contacted? Yes. Oh, well, I have my email address. <laughs> if, if you don't mind giving it. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. Could you put it yeah. In Should I? Yeah, I can put it in the chat. I think maybe that's a, a good thing to put it in the chat. Okay. Um, so whilst we're, if anybody has got any other questions, I've had um, another one here. Um, I wanted to kind of, kind of go back and ask people on um, about this about other places in terms of people where they can get published. I'm not sorry so much where they can get published, especially when they don't have a, a full manuscript yet. Or maybe, you know, except before we get to that, and can maybe you can talk to that agent thing a little bit more, um, Natalie. That would be, I think, useful as well. In terms of, do people need an agent to have a publisher? Why is it a good idea to have an agent? Well, I would say it's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I don't put myself out of a job. Uh, um, uh, yes, I mean, even, you know, uh, people who are well established in other fields, areas, um, I think benefit from having a literary agent, um, you know, purely for the, the second pair of eyes and the finessing, um, A, of the work, and then B, uh, of the connections, relationships within... The publishing industry so what i found um you know most recently uh are the you know just phenomenal auctions that you know i've been very blessed and you know lucky to have run so you know david had 14 publishers bid for the rights to his memoir mm -hmm. um you know uh Selene henry writing for children the seven publishers that he met all seven publishers bid and so, you know, and again, kind of sort of helpfully because I've been in the industry for so long since birth, pretty much, <laughs> um, you know, going around and meeting with the editors. I, I know them all. I've worked with them. I work with the marketing teams and the publicity people. So it was, you know, it's, it's easier, let's say. Some of the conversations are easier if you have representation as opposed to, you know, trying to do it and go it alone. Um, you know, I completely respect getting an agent, though, especially black talent, um, can be challenging, especially if you debut an unknown. Yeah. Um, you know, the industry can feel impenetrable. Uh, what, and that that yeah. that I think is something that we we have a lot of work to do. Well, on, you know, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just gonna say I think there are what three or four black agents in the industry at the moment and you I can know, tell you their names <laughs> more, more than about five years ago you know, I know I know even with black editors there were in terms of before black, well this is the thing and that's what I'm finding yeah, you know yeah. a little bit it's really challenging yeah. really challenging for me because you know as an editor there were like maybe five or six of us and now I'm an agent and there's three of us and it's just it's not on really yeah. Um, but I think so, another reason for people to get agents when sometimes they ask me about helping them find a publisher is the yes. fact of going through the contract. Um, yes. People, uh, people, even well-known people, are not always very good at dealing with the contractual details. Yes, absolutely. And they out on little things yeah. and, then they get, and then they wonder why they really get really sewn up by the publisher. It's because they signed a contract and didn't understand yes. it. Yes, and we know, you know, the history for Black talent, you know, not just in publishing, but in the world generally, yeah. <laughs> music especially. Music it's really important. And I, and yeah. I we people, have a difficult history. Public. If you yeah. want to have an involvement with your cover, say so from the beginning. Absolutely. Sometimes they can pick a cover that is so totally inappropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and there've been lots of yeah, issues on that. But in terms of finances, absolutely, I'm glad you raised that. So A, it's the relationships, but B, it's also ensuring that you get paid properly. Pay properly. And yeah, yeah. 
and with the right name and, and on time <laughs> yes yeah and yes with, because yeah. that's also really important to be paid for your art and your creativity exactly and exactly. respected for that mm -hmm. so yeah absolutely yeah uh i have a, another question here It'll be an, and this can few people can answer this uh Great discussion, interested in this question. Can, should a white historians write, a black, write about black history? Or if they do, should they collaborate, co-author with black historians? I mean, I think that goes for other kinds of books as well, but let me, what do you think, Robin? Uh, one of the best historians on Africa was an Englishman called Basil Davidson. And Basil Davidson set a very, very high bar because what he tried to do was to remove as much Eurocentric bias as possible. A lot of authors, though, um, they do struggle with it and it shows in their writing. Um, certainly my situation, when I have worked with mainstream editors, it's come up when they've edited my work and when you read the first draft, you could tell a black person wrote it. And when you read the edit, you could tell a white person rewrote it. And that problem isn't one that's going away anytime soon. So my thing is, if a, a, if a non-black person immerses themselves in the history properly, uh, I have no problem if they want to write that history. Yeah, I mean, I, I just mentioned like one of my, um, an experience from uh, the other angle though. I agree with you, Basil Davidson. I, I don't know any person I have met who's into black history who hasn't said this man is incredible. And yeah, we, 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 he's an authority on it. But I've been working with interns from Leicester University who work on a transcultural module publishing model. So they work, so they only work with small black and Asian publishers. And so we get to, it's, it's really interesting because then they will be asking us these questions because we'll say, ask whichever questions you want. Why do you have to do this? And why do you have to do that? And we'll say, well, this is the situation that we're in. And this is how black writers and black publishers are challenged. So what we're then kind of hoping is that when these young people go into mainstream publishing, they're taking with them this sense and this knowledge that those who are in there have never been through because they've worked with us. And they can go around and say, that's not the way to do it. You know, that mm -hmm, is insensitive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, and I've have worked with some really amazing young people and the work they've produced. And they've just thanked us to say, if we hadn't have done this, we would not have known. Or we've been taught this history on colonialism for how many years? And we weren't taught this. And they're being, they've been telling me this in the past few years. So it's still happening. So with things like that, that's how I'm hoping it's going to change. So it's not going to change quickly, maybe in our generation, but I think eventually, you know, those kind of things will change. So, um, and it and it took somebody like, you know, um, somebody being an intern with People Tree Press, and then when, as soon as she went to Leicester University, that's the one of the first things she set up because she realised how important it was and what was being missed out. Uh, okay, yeah. So, who else could wants to answer this question, please? Uh, Patrick, I know you're going to have something to say on this. Should. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it depends on the person. I don't. I mean, obviously, you can't stop anyone writing about anyone's uh, cultural lived experiences. It's about the authenticity of that account. So there have been some writers, white writers, or, or, or non-white writers who've written about the black experience in a positive way, but the vast majority has been in a dodgy way. Let's face it. That's reality. Uh, and and then the, the the thing that really gets me is there is so much black talent out there not been given the, um, the platform or even the opportunity, I should even say, to develop write, their writing skills or, or their research skills. Uh, and and there's, you've got the whole stuff around white privilege, which means that uh, if, you know, if a white person's interested in black history, they're gonna get more of a squeeze than a black person's interested in black history. Um, I'm a member of the, the Royal Historical Society. They did a survey two years ago, uh, and the report said that basically less uh, black children are less interested in black history, which means that in the future, there'll be less, even less people wanting to go to university to study history or even go into academia to teach history because the way that history has been taught currently in school and the way it's, and obviously it's dependent on their teacher and how they convey that information. 
or how it's or what or what materials they choose, and are more likely. I mean, there's there's been more of an increase in them using uh, black resource material, but not enough. I mean, I think the work that Robin does is brilliant, but not all schools know about it, and not all schools want to use it. They rather have a watered down version, a more palatable version than the real version, and that's a, and that's a problem that we have. So if we're going to talk about anti racism, I was on the call yesterday, um, event yesterday organised by the NEU Trade Union uh, with teachers, and it's about how do we get more anti racist material uh, and information, books, fiction, non fiction, not just in history but across the whole curriculum, and you've got to inspire people. So that's to me that's the real issue. Uh, it's giving people the opportunity. It's only when you're not given the opportunity then we're dependent on other people writing our history. Mm. And that's why this is really important. That's why it goes back to the point I made. There are hundreds of people, thousands of people who are doing black history day in, day out in Britain, but you won't know about them. You won't hear about them. Yeah. And this is really, really important. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you say about schools is so important because I was thinking that as well when we've been having these discussions around um, trying to have more authors of colour on the curriculum. The, the kind of framework of the conversation comes from like the exam board saying oh but we do have these books that like have um characters of color but they're all written by by white authors and that is just a different conversation like the that is always going to have a, a completely different perspective and it's going, going to be read differently and received differently and as you're saying like it's so important that like students are interested and they they see themselves reflected and they feel like their perspective is reflected and so i agree like there's you can um kind of stop people from from writing the experience that they want to write but there is a real distinction um especially when it comes to to things on the curriculum and and that young people are reading between books that are written by black authors and books that are written by white authors on the same topics i'd argue yeah i agree with that just to quickly chip in um i think you know one of the reasons yeah i, I joke about boy bands and so on and commercial non-fiction in that respect but really it's about keeping readers and keeping next generation of readers you know um around i think a lot of the time in our industry we're readers talking to readers we're, we're almost kind of in an echo chamber we're talking to ourselves and i think you know we often forget that you know kids these days we're competing with netflix we're competing with youtube we're competing with you know these enormous platforms and to keep kids interested and engaged and as you say you know our history taught and um shared we need to keep our kids you know involved and informed and um connected with the world of books and that's a massive massive challenge you know for us um i've often spoken about how you know when I was growing up, I had to wait a whole week for the next episode of my yeah. favourite show. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, my daughter Tal has her own channel on Netflix. And I, you know, it's 24 hours. So for us, you know, we're, as I say, we're often talking as if, you know, it's a given that there will be future readers. And I think we're fighting personally. I think we're fighting for them. So... Yeah, I, I suppose, do you think, though, as well, it's the way that young people are given things to read? Yeah, I remember when I was in the, in the States as well, and I was out to lunch with some people, and one woman said that she had an 18-year-old had come to her and said, I just need a book to read. <laughs> I'm fed up with reading things online. And, you yes. know, they were kind of like amazing. It's like they weren't expecting, expecting mm -hmm. that. So in some ways, are we underestimating? Do we need to look for different ways that young people are going to want to have that 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 information because they do and they do want to read um and do you think like i was just thinking i was going to ask that to people like akala um you know the artist akala and him writing do you think that helps yes people into absolutely massively so i think you know people who um can connect with young readers who are you know vibrant and energetic and you know talk to them in the way that you know they understand and as I say for me personally I think we are we are potentially fighting for their attention mm. um it's not to say that you know uh kids don't want to read but we are competing and we're competing with you know platforms and products that are slick mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the humble book 
<laughs> has to work mm. really, really hard and authors have to work really, really hard, I think. So um, that's the challenge. So it's interesting you kind of, when we brought, up, brought that up now about the future of the book, what is the future of the book? Is, is it, you know, and I'm not just saying you have to talk about it necessarily in that uh, a print format. What do you think? whether that future is like five years, because it's all moving so quickly, or 10 years. Hannah, the future of the book. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? And especially, and where, and where are Black people going to factor into that? Mm. Well, I mean, that's a really huge question you've given me. Yeah. Really <laughs> um, well, I've got my on. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Well, I mean, to be honest, I have a lot of hope that there has been a huge amount of kind of momentum in, so I've, only been in the publishing industry the last few years but in that time the momentum has been huge especially for, for black authors so I feel really really hopeful that this is kind of um yeah as long as we keep leaning into that and and, and really pushing those doors and, and making sure that they stay open and that this isn't just like a, a short-term uh, moment I think this is a really exciting time for um as Natalie was saying authors across every single genre and kind of every every platform um to 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 really have their moment and really um, have their time to kind of connect with readers. Um, but yeah, it has to be kind of, again, thinking of this as not just one one moment, but the start of, of this journey, if that makes sense. So if everybody, the rest of you as well, if you can just comment on the future of the book and very briefly, so Robin. Books are always gonna be here. Um, there's, uh, you're not going to be able to replace books with any electronic means. Uh, if you want to get from page one to page 100, you can just open up the page. Trying to do that digitally is a hard thing to do. Trying to go between two pages digitally is a hard thing to do. It's horrible. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so, so books will always be here. Natalie. Um, yeah, I agree that books will be here, but I feel that uh, they will evolve into multimedia beasts. <laughs> um, and what you'll see is, you know, TV and film, they, uh, you know, it exists currently, but I think it will become even more so. Um, I've got to agree, because I'm about to do the same thing. I'm putting a hundred black poets on, an, on a selective interactive video app. <laughs> Yeah, and social media, I think, is absolutely, yeah, is just yeah. brilliant, absolutely brilliant for debut authors, especially, you know, you're talking direct to your audience in a way that you couldn't 15, 20 years ago, um, and build your audience, even without a publisher, yeah. so, yeah. Patrick, I think, there'll be, I think there'll be a counter revolution people walk away from Twitter and Facebook and will say, we want more books. I, I, I agree with you. I went to a thing, I, um, it was a conference, it was periodical magazine publishers, and there was this, somebody who was there from BT and he was called like a futurist and he literally spoke for 60 minutes nonstop. And he ended up saying, for people, we're basically gonna come back to, we're gonna, all of this stuff around robots is gonna go, we're coming back to, it's the person who is important. That's what we're going to come back to. That's what he came back to. And it's like this, the book is going to be important. It really will. Along with vinyl records. Sorry? Along with vinyl records. Along with vinyl records, I've still got yeah. mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's been really great. You've all been really good. Thank you, Hannah, Robin, Natalie, and Patrick. That was really vibrant. And thank you so much. Thanks so much, Khadija. Khadija, I'm, 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 I've got to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to be really rude and burst There's one thing you didn't, didn't, didn't talk about, and that's reading the book out loud. That's something that I've, yes. pandemic, me and my partner, we've read several books, a fantastic experience. And when you link it to a, an audible book, listening, listening to it, then reading it, going in and out, it's just a fabulous experience. We actually started arguing with the characters, debating them, <laughs> crying. That's what a, I mean about the future of books. It's fabulous reading out loud. And remember yes. back in the day, books were supposed to be read out live. Dick yes, yes, yes. But, the multi, but multimedia, as in podcast, you know, podcast, audio book, you know, book, film, <laughs> TV, <laughs> it's everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's everything. So you have the book and then it's, yeah. Yeah, but it's just on yeah. different platforms. Yeah. 
So it's still the book. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully the author will get paid on all those platforms. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I became an agent. <laughs> is, is it still 10%? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Khadija, can I, can I thank you for that and talk about the end now? The end. It's been, it's been a great day. It's been a great day. But we're going to finish off. Well, I'm going to finish off. I know Miranda wants to say a few words, I'm sure. Um, on what was the, the, the favorite book? What was the favorite book? Now, I'll be up front. We didn't get lots of people voting, we got, but we got enough to get, uh, to get a, a feel of the market. So let, let me share my screen and uh, show you what we've done. Let me do it. Okay. Now, there was, there was a number of books that got honorable mentions. Uh, you, you recognize some of these books. Some, some are new, some are old. There's one there, there's, um, so, as I say, this one, this uh, this one from John, from uh, Jeffrey Green. That was an amazing black black ink audience. I was really impressed by that. It was in the what I'll, I'll, I'll add. I'll publish this list and also add your favorite books because there's some interesting books there. So those are those are books that didn't quite make it. But let's but let's let, let's look at the three that did. And in third place, now this this is a shock to me because this is this this would have been my seminal text, but this shows you I'm I'm proper old school. <laughs> I'm proper old school. I'm gonna say, do any of you recognize this book? You know something? I was actually gonna mention this because Patrick mentioned Edward Scobie's book, yeah. Black, Black Britannia, okay. and people think about Black British history and they always will go to staying power. And they should be going to Edward Scobie too. Okay, you know okay. what I mean? Yeah, no, so, no, you're, you're, yeah. no, you're right. You're right. Right. Do you know what number two was then? Anyone have a guess? David's book. Yeah, they did, did, only just, only just made it uh, to number no, two. Patrick's book is number one. <laughs> well, there's two well. number ones. I guess who, who wants to guess what the the, 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 the joint number ones? Hundred and one great black Britons. Maybe yeah. And, and um, you've added someone to it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who the other one would be, but it's definitely Patrick's book. Anybody? 100 Great Black Britons is there. Oh! It's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it enjoy doing it. My, my doing thought, it. Me and Andy will give you the five pound note that we'll <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look, well, I'm going to publish this, and you, you, there's going to be a prize of, of the undying thanks. <laughs> all those on there. And you can take that to the pub. Congratulations, Patrick. You can ask for you the were around there. It was the fix. What? Well, I, I, I didn't no, fix anything. Michael was in charge. No, 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 I, I'm, su I'm surprised, you know, because you know why? Because the book's, uh, the book's only been out um, seven months, eight months, and it, was, and, we, and it was launched during lockdown. And we're not, me and Angie, but I've not been to a bookshop to even talk to people or even do anything it's all been online so it's just I'm just, it's just amazing um it's just amazing i don't know what to say really i get my copy and wave it around yeah. okay okay yeah. i'm gonna challenge you right now why isn't my man in the 100 i'm talking about bill morris no 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 <laughs> i'm looking forward to when we can meet in person and i can get this signed and i was gonna wind i was gonna wind up i was gonna wind patrick up because we've got natalie here to ask him again, I'm sure a lot of people have, why was Shirley Brassie left out? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> no, 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 it's very simple. It's very simple. Can I just say we're not related? Can I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> she's from down the road, but, you know, she's not my mum. <laughs> although she does look a bit like my mum, but anyway. <laughs> no, no, can I just clarify that? Because when we did the campaign nearly 18 years, I have to say it's because certain people not on in the book, um, um, like, you know, but when we did the original campaign, she was in the top 10, yeah? Shirley Bassey was in the top 10. But we've had to update the book to have new heroes and sheroes, you know what I mean? So, so there's certain historical figures we've not got in there. We've got new contemporary figures. And so I've been challenged by people to say, how come you've got no black Tories in there? How come you've got no people in there? How come you haven't got... But they were all in Is the there anyone with... Welsh in there? Is there anyone <laughs> Welsh? Is there anyone Welsh in there? Yes. The first black woman <laughs> in Wales to have a statue named after your head kick Betty. Oh, okay. She's in the book. Oh, okay. That's well, that's good. That's good. I just felt that some of those younger contemporary ones could go in the next book. Because that gives you an excuse to do the next book. <laughs> do you know what that I mean? Is, that's that me true. and you, Hannah. 
I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Mitch. But also, but go, go back to Wales. Just I mean, we've got contact with quite a few organisations in Wales, Natalie. And I yes. know that there's, there are plans. People want to do a Welsh version of this. People want to write a... People oh, are working that's towards a good that. idea. Uh, that's I think good idea. Um, um, oh, well, there's two organisations that they contacted me. To say, yeah. Great, great yeah, done, yeah. But we want to tell our narrative. And I think it's important, actually, because the book is not... It's, the book is 100. It could have been a thousand, and at the back of the book, we've got over, over a thousand names of people that people nominated uh, as part of the campaign, the latest campaign that was. Let me tell you something funny. My friend bought the book in California, and then she said to me, "But you're not in it." <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right. But you're right, Patrick, because with the um, Literature Wales, with the Writers Development Program for Writers of Colour, um, of the the eight hour uh, judging session. Uh, I'd say 99% um, of the submissions were fiction. A lot of yeah. poets are fiction. Mm. And I think I was, I think I lobbied for, you know, nonfiction. There was one person who, you know, wrote something really, really good that was nonfiction. And that's what I mean yeah. in terms of documenting our lives and our experience, nonfiction can, can really help move the needle like massively. Yeah. Um, so you're right. You know, I, I think personally there has to be a massive investment, uh, not, or, or maybe. See, what you have, you have lots of writers' competitions on fiction. Yes. There's not that many on non-fiction. Uh, and I think if there's more competitions on, you know, and yes. there should be more, and there should be more essays. I mean, in America, it's very common. You can write, uh, you can write hundred-page essay booklet, no problem. Mm. Why can't we? Why can't publishers do the same thing? You could do a short essay, a seminal short essay, hundred, you know, ten thousand words on. You know, on a you know, look at issues around knife crime or domestic violence or, or fabulous ideas than waiting to the app, than writing, writing 300 pages. I think there's, I think there should be more incentives, uh, to encourage people to do more non fiction writing because we're in an age of critical thinking. It's really, really critical. I mean, I think a fantastic fiction book can do the same thing using devices and different mechanisms, but I think the more we are living in, um, Unfortunately, because of social media, of lots of falsehoods are going around. Yes. So going, so going back yes. to the school report, I have to go. I'm sorry. Uh, you know. Um, you know. Um, in in the history section, it plays down slavery and enslavement. Yeah, and that will be used by a number of publishers, uh, uh, other other mainstream publishers, to encourage writers to write books as anti-narrative to actually say that actually the empire was fantastic. Black people had a good time. What's the problem? Yeah. 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 I'm not joking. Yeah. No, no. I mean, that's the one thing I know we're wrapping up, but the one thing I hoped would come out of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, all the agitation is that people understanding the connection between social cohesion, our ability to live with one another <laughs> and culture. Yeah. And that you can't have, you can't omit great swathes of people and live happily. <laughs> With each other so you know political freedoms yes can take you so far but culture is really important and you're right Patrick you know documenting our lives here yeah. is why I really like black and British because you know yeah. they've been talked about that but took it to a larger stage which is what we need because you're right there are false it's falsehoods you know like there are no black people in Wales uh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that cultural cohesion is such a great point because one yeah. culture kind of pick and mixes what it wants from the other. Exactly. You know, yes. I'm thinking of curry, I'm thinking about Motown, I'm thinking about reggae. They, they, they buy all that, but mm. then a lot they don't go, we, we don't, we're not interested in that. So you, you get clubs where they're playing yes. black music, but don't let black people in. Exactly. Exactly, yeah, yeah. 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 So look, this has been fantastic. We can, can I guess you guys are all talkers. <laughs> Not that I am. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <That's> totally. <laughs> so look, there's going to be breakout rooms now. If you look in the uh, there's a, the final breakout room, which will continue until the last person leaves. So I'll leave it. I'll leave it open. It's in the chat now. Mm -hmm. So I want to finish the day. And I'm going to say I'm saying thank you to all our speakers and panelists and attendees. But you know, but it's just been an excellent day. I've got lots of notes. I've bought lots of books. You know, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. I've learned I'm a looking lot. forward to listening to everything afterwards because I saw some of the people on the panel going, I want to hear that, talk to that person, you know, and I just couldn't. So I'm really looking forward to, to listening back on these, yeah. Okay. Excellent. So Miranda, do you have, do you have the last word before, before we shut down the session and go to our rooms? 
Can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's that. Right. Sorry. Off mute. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't, if Philip was here, he ought to have the last word, really. But um, uh, thank you to everybody. And I think, you know, as, as, I, as I anticipated, it's been a great day. I've learned a lot. There's been a lot. I, I always, I sort of feel, I feel, I, I wish we had like a chance to get all four panels to speak to each other as well, because I think there are so many themes that kind of cross over between the four areas we looked at today. Um, but hopefully um, everyone's happy for, for their contact details to be shared and those conversations can Absolutely. continue, uh, you know, in the breakout rooms and, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the thing we try to do with um, what's happening in Black British history is to kind of get those conversations going, but to like encourage people to take action based on what they heard today, who they've spoken to, ideas, get those ideas flowing, get projects going. And so I hope everyone's been inspired and uh, have got lots of ideas of how to continue educating the world about Black history. Thank you. <laughs> Philip, do you want to... Um, just, uh, just to thank, thank everyone. Uh, finally, and, and to to you, Miranda. Although you've got this magnificent award at, at the end, so um, and congratulations on that. And and to to Michael, and to and to Gemma, and for all the work you've done putting this together. But I think it it worked tremendously well, and I think each panel, um, you know. Uh, brought out some really important points so it's it's great that we recorded it I'll also want to kind of go back and and think about some of those points and and look at some of those sessions again um uh but you know black, what's happening black British history continues um we'll be uh in touch soon with information about uh forthcoming events um but thank you all so much for joining us